Perhaps you feel like this is one of the worst years you've ever seen. Surely we're living in perilous times. Tony Broom Ministries presents the following encouraging sermon entitled, Your Years Do Not Fail. This is a year that somebody said we've never seen before. It's like eating a peanut. You've never seen it before and you never see it again when you eat it. That's the way the year is. It comes and goes, you haven't seen it before and you won't see it again. I was thinking about the years of the Lord. His years do not fail. And that's our subject. Your years do not fail. Hebrews chapter 1 shows the superiority of Christ. He's superior to angels. He's superior to the prophets in the Old Testament. God spoke in the time past to the fathers by the prophets. But He has in these last days spoken to us through His Son. His Son is the express image of the Father's person. His Son is superior to the angels. He's superior to all people. He's superior to the animals. He's superior to creation. He had to be superior to creation because He's the one who created everything. He's greater than all. Christ is superior to everyone. And this is done to show the superiority of Christ by quoting various scriptures from the Old Testament. The last clause of Hebrews chapter 1, verse 12 is taken from Psalm 102. Thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If He is the same, that means that His character is the same. His years are the same. If they changed, if anything about Jesus changes, then He's not the same. If His power changes, He's not the same. If He stops healing, and stops saving, and stops loving, if Jesus stops doing anything that He did when He was on earth, He wouldn't be the same. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thy years do not fail. His years do not go bad or change or become tainted like we think about. God is not even bound by time like we are. And yet He chooses to work within the frames of time so that He can have dealings with us. If God is going to deal with man, He has to work in the confines of time. He has to work within time so that He can deal with us because we are creatures of time. We're creatures of habit. We get up at a certain time usually and we go get the newspaper or the coffee or the breakfast or something, we're people of time, we're people of habit, we're bound by time, we have to be at work at a certain time, at church at a certain time, grocery store sometimes at a certain time, you have to be at the bank or you have to do certain things at a certain time. They say that when you retire you're not worried about time anymore. Well, you're not worried about it, but everyone is still bound by time to a certain degree. Time may fail us, and we often waste time, but God's time is always good. We cause God lots of grief, problems, but He Himself does not have a bad day. God does not have a bad day. Now, He has to put up a lot of bad and a lot of ill from us, but God Himself does not have a bad day. His time is not bad. His days, weeks, months, and years do not fail. Paul warns the Galatians that they were falling into a dangerous trap of quicksand fallacy by observing days and weeks and months and years. He said, you're looking to these weak and beggarly elements of the world again. You're observing days and months and years and times. You're bound by these things. You're allowing these things to control your life. He said, I'm afraid of you lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. He wanted them to live for the Lord. And even though we're creatures in this earth and we have to be going by the schedules and we have time that is dictating the things that we do, that's not who we are. 
we're not bound by time in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is limitless. When Hebrews says that He made the worlds in chapter 1, for God so loved the world, in John 3.16, is the word cosmos. He loved the world. But when Jesus came and He spoke to us, the fathers in time past by the prophets, and now He has spoken to us through His Son by whom He made the worlds that word worlds is ionas is the limitless spans of eternity his time is not bound by physical things like we are paul did not want the believers to be bound just by the things of this world and get so bogged down and worried about things of this world that they would lose out on the things of god just because time changes just because days pass just because weeks and months go by, the calendar has to be changed or the page may need to be turned when the old year goes out and the new year comes in. That in itself does not necessarily mean that the circumstances or your situation is going to change. Some people think if we could just get through this year, there's even a country song written about it. If we make it through December, we'll be fine. Well, that's not always. So what? December, March, June, April, May. It's just another month. Some people think that if the year will just change, things will get better. Just the changing of a number from one to two or from four to five, just the turning over a page. If turning over a page could change the circumstances in our world, I'd turn over every page I could find. Whether it be in a calendar or a book or whatever it is, I'd turn every page I could get a hold to if just turning a page would change things. Turning over a calendar, the only thing it does, it changes the side of the paper. It may change a few numbers, but it doesn't change circumstance. Everything bad is not going to magically disappear or get better or be automatically changed in your favor or turn to gold just because a new year rolls around. That's not what makes it happen. In the kingdom of God, we operate by faith. And faith is not bound by time. Faith is not bound by circumstance. Faith may need to operate within the confines of time and circumstance, but it does not dictate faith. Faith can dictate circumstance sometimes, many times, but circumstance should not dictate faith. The acceptable year of the Lord is talked about in Luke chapter 4, verse 19. Jesus had the Spirit of God anointed upon him to preach the gospel to the poor, to set the captive free, to recover sight to the blind, to heal the brokenhearted, let the oppressed go free, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. This year may not look too acceptable to us, but that's because we're looking at a calendar year. We're looking at things that go on within a certain time of a year. But in the kingdom of God, this is the acceptable year of the Lord. And the reason I know that is because Jesus said it was. He said to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. This refers to the church age the time of evangelism and the outreach of the gospel. And just because you think that this year may be the worst that you've ever seen, remember that the year of the Lord is a lot better than the day of the Lord. You don't want to be here during the day of the Lord. The Bible talks about the day of the Lord, and that's that bad time of judgment and tribulation that's coming on the world. You don't want to be here then. Your family, your children, your grandchildren, nobody wants to be here during that awful time of the day of the Lord. So many people will face that awful time. If you think the year is bad, that day of the Lord is a time when nobody wants to be here. And plenty of people will be on this earth to face that awful time of not just the acceptable year, but the day of the Lord. The acceptable year of the Lord even with all of its faults and failures and flaws, 
It is a whole lot better than the day of the Lord, the judgment that's coming. Your worst day as a Christian is better than the best day you ever had as a sinner. And if you are born again, you don't have a bad year. Some of our days may be better than others. But if you're a born again believer, this is not a bad year. A born again believer, the best is yet to come. When you're at the bottom, they said it got to get better on up. And when you're born again, you're not at the bottom. But when you're born again, the best is yet to come. We're not having a bad time, a bad year. That is the secular world in which we live. You say, well, I turn on Fox. Fox tells me how bad it is. That's because you need to quit listening to the fox and start looking at the lamb. Amen. Fox will trick you and cheat you. You better quit paying so much attention to the fox and start paying more attention to the lamb and the lamb will cheer you up and lift you up and build you up and bless you and help you up. That's what the lamb will do. The allowed year for cultivation. God still has us here for a purpose. And He still wants to use us no matter what the year is, no matter what the time is. Luke chapter 13 verse 6, He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Do you know that God is looking for fruit on our tree too? And he's seeking fruit, and sometimes he's not finding the fruit that he needs to find. This Lord, this plantation owner, he comes and he seeks fruit on this fig tree, and he keeps looking. And he said, well, maybe I'll give it a little more time. And he messes around a little bit more, and he comes back and he looks again, and he still doesn't find any. So after a while, then he said unto the vine dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? This is three years I've been looking for fruit on this tree, this tree here, bearing fruit, and it's not doing anything. He said, cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? In other words, what just taking up space? That's all it's doing. Taking up valuable space could be used for a tree that will bear fruit instead of just taking up space. Preacher told a black gal, he said, when you get married and you find your husband, don't you look for somebody just taking up parking space. Look for somebody who will love you like you need to be loved. And that's the way it is with this. This fig tree is just taking up space. It's not doing anything. There's no fruit. It's just wasting time, wasting space. Cut it down, just taking up space on the ground. He answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Lord, give it one more year. What about the year? If the year could just change, if things could just be better. He said, Lord, let it just one more time. Let it have one more year. And let me dig about it. Some folks just need a little digging about it. Just prod it up a little bit. Let me dig about it and let me dung it. Some people need to be dunged a little bit. Some don't need to be dunged. They're already full of dung. But he said, let me dig about it. Let me dung it. Let me fertilize it. Uncle Roger. Y'all don't know Uncle Roger, but he had some of the best tomatoes this side of heaven. And everybody wanted to know how in the world did Uncle Roger's tomatoes always turn out so good. And he wouldn't tell everybody for a long time. And finally they said, Rog, you got to tell us how these tomatoes turn out so good. He said just two words, horse manure. That'll do it every time. So things that we think are not worth anything, God can use anything. Even a little dung in the help a tree to bear fruit. Sometimes we have to go through dirt. Sometimes we have to go through dung in this life. Bad time. 
a messy time. We have to go through things in this life, but you know what? It produces beautiful fruit. Let it alone this year also. Let me work on it a little bit. And if it bears fruit, good. You got you some good fruit. If not, then after that, and the master had told him, you cut it down. But notice what it says. If it bears fruit, that's good. But if not, then thou shalt cut it down. God is the one who decides who goes where. He's the one who decides who stays and who goes and who's cut down and who's allowed to prosper. This reminds us of the teaching in John chapter 15 about the vine and the branches. Jesus is the true vine. We are the branches. The Father is the vine dresser, the one who takes care of it. The unproductive branches are cut off and cast into the fire. That's what happens to those who bear no fruit. You can call it fire, you can call it hell, you can call it whatever you want to, but it ends up the unproductive branches that are just there to cause trouble, don't do any good, they don't listen to the Word of God, they don't listen to the preacher, they won't do what God says do. They want their name on the roll, they want to have a place when they have a funeral, but as far as really doing anything in the kingdom of God, they're unproductive. Now the fig tree, been there three years not doing anything, these branches on the vine, he said they need to be cut off or they need to be pruned where they can bear more fruit. The fruitful branches are pruned so as to be able to bring forth more fruit. The Father will take care of that. If you have a desire, I don't care in the time that we live, it seems like we're hindered from doing a lot of things, but if you have a desire in your heart, just to do something for God. I want to do something for God. It may just be speak a kind word to someone. It may be pray for someone when I know about a prayer need. Whatever it is, I want to do something for the Lord. Who put that desire in your heart? Did you put that desire in there yourself? Did the devil put it in there? No, God puts that desire. If you have a desire to do something for the Lord, the Lord put that desire in your life. I want to do something for the Lord. That is God pruning the branch. He's trying to prune us. He's trying to get us to bring forth more fruit. The branch must abide in the vine in order to maintain life and to continue to be productive and bear fruit. Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. Without me, you can do nothing. Abide in the vine as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself. No more can you except you abide in me. We have to stay connected to the vine. That's why it's so important in the time that we live to stay connected to the vine, not only the vine of Christ, but the church. To stay connected to the church. Don't fall out and get to a place where nobody can reach you, nobody can contact you, you don't want to have anything to do with anybody, you become distant. They already talk about social distancing. Well, social distancing is one thing, but spiritual distancing is a whole horse of another color. We don't want to be spiritually distant. You can be close to your brothers and sisters, even though you may be physically apart sometimes. We want to be close to our brothers and sisters, close to the vine. We want to be connected to the vine so that life can flow through the branches and we can bear fruit. Your years do not fail. If we are going to be successful, whatever the year is, we have to stay connected to the vine. The alerted year of death, Jeremiah chapter 28, verse 16 and 17, Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee, this is the prophet Hananiah, from off the face of the earth, this year thou shalt die, because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. So Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. We certainly had no way of knowing about any of the woes that have come our way this past year. The Bible even says that we don't even know what a day may bring forth. Jesus teaches us that we should not fret or worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of the things of itself. Today has enough issues of its own to be concerned about. Sufficient until the day is the evil thereof. With that being said, if you absolutely knew for certain, without a doubt that you were going to die this year, would you live any differently? 
Hananiah was told, because you have taught rebellion against the Lord, this year you will die. God doesn't want us to go around worrying about every day, will I die today? Will I be killed today? Will I die this year? That's not what God wants us to do, but we need to think about it, especially people that are our age. We need to be thinking about where we're going. And so many people that are facing pandemic and are facing situations at our age, they never give a second thought as to where they're going. There are not but two places to go. It's either heaven or hell. And if you're not sure about heaven, chances are that you're on your way to hell. And if you're not on your way to hell, you're on your way to heaven, and you can be sure about it, you can know that you're born again. You can know that you're on the right track. You can know. They say the theme is get back on the right track. Well, I don't have to get back on the right track. Glory to God, I'm on the right track. I was on the right track when I got born again. I've gotten off here and there, but I haven't stayed off by the grace of God. I have a desire in my heart to serve God. And when I mess up and make mistakes, and I get off sidetracked, you might call it, the Holy Spirit deals with me, and I'm quick. I want to get back on line. I want to get back on track. I don't want to be that branch and get chopped off and thrown in the fire. I want to be what God wants me to be for His name's sake. I want to be in that awaiting year of promise. God told Abraham, chapter 17, verse 21, But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. This set time. There's a set time. God said, I'm going to bring the promise to pass. You've been waiting a long time. You've been going through hardships and you've had disappointments. You've tried things your way. But I am going to bring the promise to pass. At this set time in the next year, Sarah will have a son. And you will call his name Yitzhak. In Hebrew it means laughter. He will bring laughter. That's what a baby does. A baby changes everything, the psalm said. He or she will either bring laughter into the home or it will drive you nuts one way or the other. But most of the time, they bring laughter into the home. You can't help but laugh at them. You try not to. They do something crazy, mean as a snake sometimes. You try your best not to laugh at them. You just can't help it. They just make you laugh. That's what God said. I'm going to bring this promise to pass, and I will establish my covenant. That covenant is still... It's not really in effect right now. Well, it is, but God is not working in that covenant right now. There's a new covenant. You and I are in the new covenant of blood, mercy, grace, and truth. But that Abrahamic covenant was never broken by the Lord. The children of Israel broke His covenant, but God never undid His covenant with Abraham. God said, I'll make a covenant with you, I'll give you the land, and you will have this land forever. And God will see to it that they dwell in that land forever. God's promise to Abraham was to give him a son, and he brought it to pass. God's promise to us is to send his son to come and get us. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. That's a promise. God has given us a promise to come and get us. Could this be the year of the rapture of the church? Might this be the dawning of that grand and glorious day? When the face of Jesus we behold. Maranatha, the Lord is coming. Keep looking up, believer. Jesus could return at any moment. When the trumpet sounds, we'll be ready to meet Him in the air. Morning and night at noon, Jesus is coming soon. Whenever He comes, we'll be ready to go be with Him. His years do not fail. And while the ages roll, we'll keep on praising Him. Throughout the endless ages of eternity, we'll keep on praising and glorifying our Lord. We'll be with Him forever. There'll be no night there. Time won't matter anymore. Because Jesus is Lord. He'll be ruling and reigning and we'll live with Him forever.
Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be in this place today. Thank you that we can share this word with your people. And I pray, Lord, that you would encourage our hearts. No matter what the time is, no matter what the year is, you're still the same. Your years do not fail. And I thank you, Lord, that we're not bound by Washington. We're not bound by London or Moscow. We're not bound by the things of this world. We have to work within the confines of physical things sometimes. And physical things affect us. But we're not bound by these things. We're on your timetable. We're in your hands. It's like the prophet said, my times are in your hands. And we thank you, Lord, that you have us in your hands. You have us in your control. We are under your jurisdiction. We are your sons and your daughters. Your years are our years. Our years are your years. Your years do not fail. And I pray, Lord, that many people would come into the timetable, not in this physical crazy world, but into the timetable of God's everlasting, eternal kingdom. We thank you for that, Lord, and give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us for this encouraging sermon entitled, Your Years Do Not Fail. Remember that all of our podcasts are available on the YouTube channel, and the most current sessions are also available on the ministry blog and podcast page. Visit www.tonybroom.com for the latest. This has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries. 